Hello and welcome to another Hip Historian Virtual Happy Hour Tour. My name is Brenda Holt and I am with AARP Arizona. We are the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering people 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. And with a nationwide presence of nearly 38 million members across the nation and approximately 900,000 right here in Arizona, we work to strengthen communities and we advocate for what matters most to families, such as health security, financial stability, and personal fulfillment. During the month of September, we will raise the awareness and priority engagements of AARP's offering for older adults while helping workers stay competitive at work. AARP is a wise friend and fierce defender of older workers and has program offerings and resources that align with each of these consumer pillars. We are a wise friend in a rapidly changing job market. You can count on AARP to help you navigate your job search and career path and fight back against age bias. We are also a fierce defender. AARP is fighting to strengthen age discrimination laws, increase protections, and help companies across the country foster age-diverse workplaces that value experience. For more information and resources, please visit us at aarp.org backslash work or aarp.org backslash Arizona. Thank you again for attending today's session. Well, hello and good evening. I want to welcome you all to Arizona History Happy Hour. Oh my gosh, you know, it's been such an exciting week here. Um, Monday, I was on ABC 15. We've started doing all kinds of fun things. So, you know, I want to welcome you. And also, we are now for the first time on LinkedIn, which is really exciting as well. So we are on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, and LinkedIn. So thank you all for watching on so many different platforms. I'm so happy you're here as we get a chance to play around with some Arizona history. So my name is Marshall Shore and I will be your host. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But you know, today is Arizona's an interesting day because back on September 1st, back in 1865, which was right after the Civil War, the first public mail made its way back to Arizona. The first public letter landed in Tucson back on this date, back in 1865. It is also celebration of that iconic pink Cadillac, whether it was Elvis, Mary Kay, Bruce Springsteen, or Natalie Cole that you associate with it, it became a pop icon still to this day. So I wish I had one. Maybe somebody out there has one. It is also Emma M. Nut Day. Now you might be wondering who was she, but she was on September 1st of 1878, Alexander Graham Bell, put her as the first female telephone operator. Her career lasted for about 35 years and was really one of the first women in tech. And you know, I sure know a few women in tech always hoping there's more. It is also Ginger Cat Appreciation Day. So you know, whether it is from Morris to Garfield, all those Ginger Cats had become celebrities. Hello, and we are celebrating you today. Now, it is also National No Rhyme Nor Reason Day. Now, this takes its cue really from a line in three Shakespeare plays, but it also means that we're looking for words that have no rhyme and a day where you can do anything without reason. So maybe you want to start off with some of those words that you don't really find rhymes for, like chimney, wolf, and I'm hoping you all have an opus of a day. 
Now, what can you expect tonight on Arizona History Happy Hour? You know, we're going to be doing, we always do a little bit of music history, little Arizona, talking about a town in Arizona, as well as some trivia. We've even got a bit of a beverage. And from the vault, which is something you might drive by every day and don't know exactly what it is or don't even notice that it's there. And of course, we have an oh so special guest. So let's motor on through. If this is your first time watching, you might wonder, who is that man and why is he on my screen? Well, as I said, my name is Marshall Shore and I got here to Arizona a little over 22 years ago. Um, I was working in a beautiful Carnegie building in Brooklyn and decided to trade that all for something completely different. Lots of sun, no snow. And it was a beautiful 1950s library down in South Phoenix where there was this rich oral tradition of the community. And that really got me looking at Arizona in different ways. We promptly moved into a 1956 ranch when we got here. And I love the fact that it's still kind of a time capsule. There's my kitchen still looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile that's still there. Now, as soon as we got here, all I kept hearing about how there was no history here. But, you know, I knew that wasn't true because every time I went somewhere, I would come face to face with so many amazing people, places, and stories. And then there's that post-war boom that I think in so many ways made the Arizona that we all know and love today. All those GIs that either were stationed here, trained here, or passed through on their way to somewhere else. And after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers, looking for a whole new way of life. Now, I'm also called the hip historian, which means I get to play a lot with Arizona history. So I get to have fun things like we've been doing. Um, you may have seen on other social medias, we've been doing some things with local buzz, talking about some local landmarks. So that's been a lot of fun. And we've got more fun stuff coming up with that. Um, also, the end of next month, we have our band book reading. Um, we are starting to do some trivia to kind of talk a little bit about that. And so we are also, right after Thanksgiving, doing dinner and a seance down in Bisbee at the Greenway House. Um, we have our first round of haunted walking tours coming up later next month on the 17th. So you can find information about that on... hiphistorian.com. And so one of the things that I've been wanting to do is kind of, talk, you know, as we get ready for band book week and basically bringing attention by looking at band books, one of it's like, so there was a famous children's book that was banned in the U S because it was considered talking animals were considered to be ungodly. And it was shockingly enough that favorite Charlotte's Web. Now, even though it was published in 52 and about the mid 2000s, a group of parents got together and felt that it was disrespectful to have talking animals. And so it got banned. Now, if you want to find out more information about our band reading coming up, that's September 23rd. You can find that at either the allonehouse.org or hiphistorian.com as well. Now I see folks like Ryan, Pam, and Karen and others have found the chat. So please, if you need to, please chat along with folks there. Um, if you have something you want to say outside of that, you can always throw a note to me on Facebook, Instagram, or various other social medias, because I love to hear from you all, because that's where my best sources of information come from. So... I love to hear from you all. Now, it is indeed happy hour, and it would not be a happy hour without a beverage. And so today we are doing from Phoenix Beer Company. Let's see. Oh, and there we have a little silent Bob sitting there. All right. So this is Marinci Copper. Oh, mine beer from my very first growler. 
oh, and I did a really bad job of pouring that. So we're not going to drink that quite yet because there's a lot of foam there, which is dissipating quickly, as I can see. But I'm not going to taste it right now. All right. All right. So Little Arizona, where we get a chance to talk about a smaller town throughout Arizona. And so we are going to tonight talk about Sacaton, which is in Pinell County, has a population of about 1,500 folks. The town itself was established in 1858. But, you know, it actually has a much deeper history with the Gila River Indian community and tr communities under that. So if you make your way down there, you can visit the Hogum Heritage Center, which is an amazing facility that really talks about the history, the stories, the languages of the community. So if you get a chance, go visit. It's quite interesting. You can also in Sacaton find memori the Memorial Park, which is for Matthew P. Juan and Ira Hayes. Now, Matthew was... Um, the first indigenous community person that was killed during World War I in Arizona. And Ira Hayes was known for being one of the flag raisers at Iwo Jima, captured in that iconic photo and then later in the statue. And for the longest time, he was actually mislabeled on the statue. And they finally got that corrected. So you can go check those out and take a look. Now, also Gila River, there was, it was part of the incarceration of the Japanese internment camps. And so this memorial to that. And so you can go down there and take a look and learn more about that dark part of our history. Now, there's also these weird little kind of rock teepees, which, you know, the thought is that they were there to mark the reservation boundaries. But initially, it was discovered that they're both geographically and demographically wrong. And yes, it is on Instagram as well for the first time tonight. So hopefully we get a few folks watching that way. I'm intrigued to see what that is. So, you know... And even though the Gila tribe timbers never lived in teepees, they were mainly in adobe bricks. So this was just completely out of sorts for where it is. So no one really knows what they were there for. You can also go visit a equestrian center. And with that, you can, it's really designed for families, children, people who are first time on a horse, people who are, wanting to just get out and enjoy the Arizona sunshine. And so with Arizona History Happy Hour, you know, I want to thank you all so much for being here. And, and Andres, you know, how do I handle talking about tough histories? A lot of times it's just the fact bringing it up. So many times it's easier to gloss over it than it is to not mention it. So that's why I bring up the internment camps and that it is a part of our history and not to forget that and to be able to know where those spots are and that were, there were people against it then, there were people against it now. So, up oh, and look, it's now time where I can tie a little Morency Copper. Oh, and good selection, PJ. Thank you so much. And so, I am so excited to get a chance to bring on Matthew. Hello. How are you? I am good. And yourself? I'm good. So, Matthew, folks that may not know who you are, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, and your Matthew. family. <laughs> um, my name is Matthew Crane. So I am one of the fifth generation members of the Lures family. Um, and yes, we're still around. Um, and we're one of the many families that, that started it all. So we predate statehood. Um, my family goes all the way back to uh, the 1860s, but 
there are other families. It's not just my family. Um, and we're all immigrants. My family came from Northern Germany. Um, and, uh, um, so, uh, um, uh, my great, great grandparents came here, but it wasn't just them. Um, it was, uh, my great, great grandfather and his brothers and, uh, his wife, my great, great grandmother and uh, her sisters and other relatives. And then everybody branched off and if they weren't married up, got married and then, um, it, it, you know, it multiplied regarding, you know, families and kids and businesses and all that. Um, so uh, I, I'm of the fifth generation. Um, I believe my family's up to eight or nine generations, if you're including wow. you know, recent babies and babies. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there's one family that is the oldest, that, that it's 10 generations uh, don't quote me on that, but, but, there, but there's quite a few. All right. So now we've got some trivia coming up and now with our trivia, we do it a little differently than if you're, if you're used to bar trivia, where it's not just all we care about is what's the question. Do you know the answer? Yes or no and move on. So what we've got is we've got a series of questions that are multiple choice. Some are yes, no. And we're going to take a little bit of an Arizona music break and then come back and go through those answers and tell the stories of those answers. And so that's always, I think where the, the fun comes in is just that conversation and getting a chance to learn more about Arizona than we knew before. So, all right. So now people can keep tabs of their answers. Some folks do it in the chat. I've seen some folks do it. My friend Anita, if she's on, will be doing it in her special notebook. So people have their own ways of tracking their trivia answers. You can do it however you would like. So, all right. So let's get started with our first question. All right. Question one. Arizona became a state only eight weeks after what? Oh, eight weeks before what disaster? Was it A, the sinking of the HMS Titanic? Was it B, the Hindenburg? C, the San Francisco earthquake? Or D, the Alaskan volcano eruption? So when, do you, when Arizona became a state, it was only eight weeks before one of those disasters. Which one do you think it was? All right. Which of the following is the newest? Is it A, the city of Phoenix? Is it B, Maricopa County? C, state of Arizona? Or D, city of Tempe? Which of those is the newest? All right. Question three. The Lures Hotel in Phoenix, 1872 to 1980, was the first hotel to install conditioned air? Is that true or false? And the next question is kind of along that lines, but Phoenix's San Carlos Hotel, 1928 to present, was the first Arizona hotel built with air conditioning. Is that true or false? You know, what a day to be talking about air conditioning on a day where we really need it. All right. So question five, which Arizona community cannot be accessed from Arizona? Huh? All right. Well, okay. So is it A, Cibola, B, Beaver Dam, C, Littlefield, or D, all of the above? All right. Question six. In 1853, a diplomat, Jay Gadsden, bought what from Mexico? A, railroad lines. B, army supplies. C, bottom half of Arizona. Or D, land for an embassy. All right. So which one of those do you think Gadsden bought from Mexico? All right. Question seven. Which of the following is 
an incorporated city? Is it A, Sun City, B, Sun City West, C, Sun Lakes, or D, Apache Junction? Which of the following is an incorporated city? All right, question eight. Which of two Arizona communities are still owned entirely by a copper mining company? Is it A, Ajo and Miami, B, Baghdad and Marinci, C, Kearney and Hayden, or D, Duncan and Thatcher? So which do you think of those communities are still owned or still company towns? All right, so question nine. In 1946, the Rural Metro Corp Fire Department began in present day Central Phoenix at 500 West Camelback Road. Is that true or false? Question 10. The Hall of Flame Firefighting Museum in Phoenix is the world's blank fire museum. Is it A, the newest? Is it B, largest? C, the oldest? Or D, the smallest? Which do you think of those best describes the Hall of Flame Firefighting Museum? All right, and now we have a couple bonus questions. So back, let's talk about question 11, Paul Galvin founded which company that became Arizona's largest private employer during the 80s? Was that A, Honeywell, B, Garrett, C, Motorola, or D, Allied Signal? All right, which one of those do you think Paul Galvin founded? And we're gonna move on to our last and final question. The Wholesome Bakery was located near a, Sacaton, B, Phoenix, C, Mesa, or D, Flagstaff. All right. While you're trying to figure out where the Wholesome Bakery was, we are going to move on and take a little bit of an hour's music, music break. And so now, Matthew, you can chime in at any point because you probably know far more about this than I do. We are going to talk about a group called Mr. Mister. So they had a variety of albums. They were all, actually not all, most of them were from Central High. Um, yes, so most people don't know. M most of the group uh, grew up in Phoenix. Um, John Lang, who wrote uh, a lot of the music, most of the music, most of the lyrics, uh, very close to Rich Page, the lead singer, um, both of those are relatives of mine by marriage. Um, and, uh, so, you know, the, the, the majority of the group, uh, went to school together at, at Central High School, um, in, years before, uh, I went to high school, uh, to a different high school, but I, you know, I grew up as a kid knowing them, um, and uh, they, in the 70s, uh, were, I want to say, you know, a, a progressive jazz band. Um, I have some of their old vinyl. And they went by the, the, the title, The Pages, and had a completely different sound. And that, I guess, that kind of worked for them. And then by the early 80s, they changed their sound and they changed their name and they became what a lot of us uh, of a certain age know today as Mr. Mister. And, uh, and then of course, MTV came around in 1981 and then that kind of made you, um, and they made videos and the two iconic songs were written by my cousin, uh, John Lang. And of ah. course that, uh, that really catapulted them. Um, Rich uh, is still uh, uh, on tour with different uh, groups he writes um, his brother makes um, uh, his, his brother and his uh, sister-in-law make uh, instruments uh, he tours with Ringo on and off um, 
He lives out in Malibu um, and his neighbor uh, is Rick Springfield. And then uh, my cousin lives out in Malibu and he still writes. Um, of course, they're, you know, having that much fame back then kind of changed them. It was a lot of money. It was the go-go 80s, um, a lot of partying, a lot of divorces, a lot of rehab, <laughs> Uh you know, not for me. I mean, I, you know, I wasn't a musician. In fact, uh, my whole path in life was completely different than most of my relatives who all worked in the family businesses or the, the, the traditional endeavors. But, um, you know, but, you know, they had success with that and they still do, uh, you know, and they still are, you know, really good at writing that. And and uh, and there are many groups that came from Phoenix. Um, that's just one of them. But uh, yeah, I mean, that was that's the fun. It's like there's so many groups. Yeah. But, and that's but, you know, when you mentioned but, these but were family, that, like, oh my know, gosh, we've got to talk about them then. But so. I got to say that, you know, the two big songs are, are, you know, my favorite songs. I mean, you know, I, I love hearing them and it, there seems to be a resurgence. One one quick thing I'll hit on, though, they put out unreleased music uh, uh, on a, uh, uh, you know, on a, a new album, uh, you know, because I still use that term. Uh, I want to say they got released like 10 years ago. Uh, and, the, the you know, the uh, uh, the CD is called Pull. Interestingly, uh, that's all in response to all that music being written and ready to go in the late 80s, very late 80s, and something very bad happened at the record company, uh, at Capitol Records, uh, something that probably most people would have been aware of, and that was that uh, Mr. Men Menendez, whose sons ended up, um, you know, uh, you know, being involved in his demise uh, and going to prison, that was a famous Hollywood homicide, was in charge of all the music. And so that um, that whole record vault got basically put on the shelf. So that never got released. And so finally it was released. Um, and uh, so it was somewhat dated. However, uh, it took, I think, 23 years before they released that music as new music but it was actually written in the late eighties. So they and, weren't and together. Now, now the, and say, and now the eighties are having a huge resurgence. Yeah. But people were like, you know, are they back together? No, it was just music that they, an album that they put out when they were together before they broke up. Um, that was never released that, you know, it was already all bought, paid for package and all that. And it was just something that they wanted to see finally put out. And it took all that time to do that. So, yeah, indeed. All right. Well, thank you so much. And then, you know, that was such a, a delight because I always love learning about new groups that were from Phoenix. I didn't realize they were from here at all. So now we're getting ready for some answers. All right. And so our first question was Arizona became a state only eight weeks before what disaster? And indeed, it was a the sinking of the Titanic. And it was just eight weeks after that. All right. And which of the following is the newest? We had cities, we had counties, and it is C, the state of Arizona. And Matthew, who is that fine gentleman sitting there at the desk? It's really hard for me to see. That looks like my great uncle. Is that not? Oh, I didn't realize you were I, related. I, well, no, I, I can't. I, well, he's, I, oh, oh, sorry. He's really, also buried in a... In a um, I can't tell. <laughs> he's buried in a, in a pyramid out near Papago Park. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Then that's not. That's not. Okay. Then that's Governor Hunt. <laughs> it is indeed Governor okay. Hunt. So that is from Forgive a me. display they have they, down they look, at the Capitol Museum. They look Museum. similar and your picture was tiny. So. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> All right. So the Lures Hotel in Phoenix was the first hotel to install conditioned air. And that's true. So tell us a little bit about the, where, where was the hotel? Okay. So the, uh, the picture on the right, uh, for everybody that's viewing this, uh, I took this picture in the spring of 1976 from the Wells Fargo building at 100 West Washington on, 
I'm going to say like the fifth floor, the sixth floor. What you're looking at there is uh, a downward view of the intersection of First Avenue and uh, Washington. That is the original Patriots Park. So that got that got wrecking balled, and then there was a second uh, second coming, if you will, of Patriots Park with underground parking. That got removed by the city, and then they put in basically what you see today in different versions, which is, you know, with, uh, I want to say, what is it, the bowling alley, the drugstore, and a million other things, the comedy right. club. But before what you see there was in the picture, basically it was um, drollers, uh, bars, uh, it was uh, Mesa Optical, it was pawn shops, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, you know, it was the Bowery. Um, on the left is the lures uh, or the hotel lures. So that's basically um, the the um, the stable of of the uh, family business. It's kind of what we started with. We started with a wheelwright and stable, um, and then it evolved into a, a hotel. Uh, you know that's you know, a, a very, very latter picture. The building is actually a brick structure. Um, in fact, uh, for a long time, it was the largest brick structure in the state, if uh, certainly in the in the county, but it got covered over with the stucco and, and painted white. So it's, it's hard to tell that that's actually brick. And then to, to the right, basically everything uh, on the right side of the picture building wise is still there today. Um, there's a new hotel behind the Lures building, um, but everything really, thankfully, is untouched. Uh, you know, the only thing that's been added in is all the light rail um, uh, additions on the, on the street itself. Uh, the uh, picture of the hotel is uh, on the left is a, a postcard picture, but basically uh, our hotel was... was uh, was built, uh, added on to, and remodeled several times. Um, I remember my grandmother before she passed in the 60s. Um, and it, you know, and then uh, keeping in mind, uh, my uh, great great grandparents had four kids, uh, two girls and two boys. My grandmother was born in the late 1800s, my mother was born in the early 1920s. So, uh, well, it's now September. So in two days, if she was still alive, she'd be celebrating her 98th birthday. Uh, I just turned 60. So fortunately, you know, I got to uh, learn a lot of these stories uh, firsthand from people, even at a young age, um, you know, before their memory was gone, but I was still old enough to, to retain it. Um, uh, you know, before they passed from people that actually lived it. So, you know, she told me and my mom told me that um, they added conditioned air. It wasn't built with a conditioned air, but the hotel was upgraded several times. It suffered a major fire um, oh. in 1916, I want to say, 1914. Um but I remember my mother telling me that her parents were on their honeymoon and were out in downtown Glendale and uh, were notified and could see the fire um, from the, the, the uh, hotel burning in Glendale and made their way back downtown. And I actually have a picture of uh, one of the fire trucks in front of the hotel pumping water in it, but we rebuilt. So unlike the, um, the Adams, which was catastrophically destroyed. Uh, most of the hotel uh, was salvaged. Um, oh. And then, you know, of course, uh, just because we're talking about uh, condition air, before that, you had ceiling fans. So uh, the uh, elevator boy would come up to your room, the bellman, whoever, with a, uh, a pole, you know, almost looks like a fireman's pike pole, and he would click on your ceiling fan and adjust it to the speed that you desired it to be at, um, you know, and, and setting. 
Also, if you desired to, you could sleep on the second floor uh, outside mezzanine, if you will. You can see that uh, more, a little bit more in detail on that left postcard view. Uh, it would be up there above the pillars and you could sleep outside. Um, there was, uh, I don't want to call them hammocks, but they were like uh, these bed, almost like bed swings or lawn swings. Um, so, you know, there's times of the year where the weather is nice and the monsoons aren't uh, coming in and uh, people um, could sleep out there. And of course, it was quiet, you know, decades ago. So you didn't have traffic all night long. It was it was dead calm. Uh, my grandmother told me and, and, and my mother told me, I mean, you couldn't do that today. <laughs> but uh, but back then you could. Well, and you can still see as you go along, some of the houses, um, some of the older housing in downtown still have those sleeping porches. Yes, yes. Where people would have done exactly that in their private homes. They would have slept out under the stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, I want to say there's a house. Uh, there was one over by the old uh, Valley West Mall uh, north of downtown Glendale. And I believe that there's one at, at uh, Hayden and McDowell, the old farmhouse with an enclosed porch. I used to build oh, okay. Yeah. Used to build a lot of those, and that that was the purpose, or one of the main purposes, so you could sleep right. out there. Yeah, indeed. Oh, all right. And the San Carlos Hotel was the first hotel built with air conditioning, and that is true. Yes, um, and a, a, again, a note on that. So we added conditioned air. That was built with air conditioning. And that hotel was built on the site of the old grade school. Um, and uh, so the, the first generation of my family to be born here, because we came from Germany, went all went to school at that grade school. And then it got knocked down and they built uh, the San Carlos. So if you go down to the basement, there's all kinds of notations and stuff in the uh, basement in reference to it being the grade school. Um, and uh, Robert Malecki and I uh, have known each other over the years. And interestingly enough, we grew up in the same neighborhood. We went to the same high school and at the same time, our houses were back to back. Uh, uh, oh, wow. Cowback Mountain, And we both are from families that owned competing hotels. <laughs> you know, that is not, funny. Not, yeah, and, and he got into historical preservation only because they knocked down our hotel. Um, so, oh, uh, I didn't realize that's what got him into preservation. That's, that's what got him fighting mad, if you will, about uh, saving oh. all of our buildings. And you know, before I forget, it, if he's watching, I just want to put a shout out to, to, to Robert, you know, that, that uh, to say hi, because uh, uh, he's, he's a dear guy. And, uh, you know, and so is his dad. His dad is a piece of history, American history. And indeed, you know, yes. You know? the general. But, uh, but I just wanted to say that, uh, uh, it, you know, Robert, Robert's a great guy. He's put out a lot of books. Um, he, you know, he was taking pictures of stuff long before, you know, I got on the, you know, bandwagon, but, uh, but, you know, uh, um, there, there's a lot of people out there that are in the historical preservation and thank God, because we'd have a lot, a far lot less than we have right. now which is not enough. You know? Right. No, I mean, and I think it's interesting because it's like you now have, and I think we've reached a bit of a tipping point where you now have developers that are not necessarily looking to just knock down and build, build, but are actually looking at those old structures and thinking, okay, well, you know, it's better than going to a landfill and they're better built than what we would be building now. So you've, yeah. you've got, you've got some homes that are actually sticking around because people think that that's a valuable or that sense of scale or that sense of design that's inherent in those buildings because of when they were built. Well, yeah, yeah you know, and uh, I'm not a politician. I mean, not yet. And I, and I want this to be a, a, a you know, fun and interesting. So, you know, but, but this whole topic, you know, it, it skirts on the edge of politics. And so I, and I don't want to get into that. I want to keep right, this no. interesting and fun, right. but I, I will say that it, this topic, it's very hard to not go to the other side because they're so intertwined. Uh, I, I will tell the, the viewing audience that 
most of the city councils in this county in the state, uh, but certainly this county, half of them were comprised of people who aren't from here. Now that doesn't make those people bad, but that certainly in my lifetime I've seen has played into it's very easy to give in to somebody at the podium who wants to come in here and develop a whole block. And in order to do that, that block's got to go. And those people are like, I didn't grow up here. I have no childhood memories of that entire block, you know, <laughs> and, you know, and then you see that time and time again, you know, um, so it, it's a dilemma. Right. It's always a dilemma. And that's one of the things that's the reason why I do this. I mean, I'm not from here, but there are just so many stories that we need people to be aware of. No, but you know, what's so, interesting is you're not, but yet you have more enthusiasm than, than, than your equal who's sitting oh, in, in, in a, in a voted or appointed position right. who should have that same enthusiasm and doesn't, right. you know, who just wants to whack the gavel and be on to the next piece of paper in front of them. So, I don't know, but I'm just saying. So. Indeed. Well, it's, it's always, I mean, it's, there's a, there's a handful of us that are out there always debating, okay, this building, it's like, what's going to happen to it? Let's put up a fight for it. And so, but that's, yeah. it's, but there's now starting to be almost a tipping point where people have realized that we're losing too much and that we've lost too much. And so now they think there's more of an effort to try and save things. So it's not quite as difficult as it was. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. So question five, which of the Arizona communities cannot be accessed from Arizona? And it's all of the above. So Matthew, can you explain? <laughs> um, I just, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I do consulting, uh, fire service consulting. And, uh, so I was, I was always, uh, baffled by, uh, you know, two of those are at the very top of Mojave County. And one of those is at, at you know, the far extreme edge of, of uh, uh, La Paz County. And, uh, um, you know, um, and I was shocked that uh, I go, how do you, how do you, how do you get there? Oh, you got, you got to go into another state to, to act, you know, so uh, for Beaver Dam and Littlefield, you can only access those through basically uh, through Nevada or Utah. And for Cibola, you got to go to Blythe, California, and then, you know, cross the river and then come back. Oh, um, my gosh. I mean, you know, you could you could fly there in a helicopter or maybe use an, an all-terrain vehicle. But basically, I mean, if you're in, you know, mom and dad's car, you're going to another state and then coming backwards. And I... <laughs> And wow. I thought, wow, that's really interesting. I mean, I'm sure the, the Arizona is not unique. I'm sure there's other places in, in the United States or if not the world where something like that exists too, you know, and, you know, you got places on the Canadian border where you got to go into Canada to come back to the United States, you know, uh, that, I mean, I know that for a fact, but I'm just saying, I just thought that's really interesting. Like I got to throw that question out to, you know, uh, students that I occasionally have or, or you know, clients. <laughs> well, you know? I, I, right. because, yeah, I guess, like, what are you going to do for that? If, if you were presented with this situation, what's your plan B? You know, I, I, uh, <laughs> and so people kind of love that. They're like, I didn't know that. You right, know? exactly. So, and that's why I was like, we've got to include that because I didn't know that either. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, a wildlife preserve in Cibola. Um, I really haven't explored Beaver Dam and Littlefield. So. All right. So in 1853, U.S. diplomat Jay Gadsden bought what from Mexico? The bottom half of Arizona, pretty much. The Gadsden purchase. Yeah. So, I mean, I always thought it was interesting. Um, that it's like you have so many families who were, they never moved, but their nationality changed because of where suddenly now their line was redrawn. But indeed, it was like the, the bottom half of Arizona was bought, as somebody mentioned, for a pittance. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, anybody that is is interested in seeing that marker, um, it's it's only accessed through the southbound I-10 uh, rest stop at, at uh, Sacatone. So it's not at the northbound, it's at the southbound. And it's towards the, the back of the cluster buildings. And there really isn't any sign that tells you that it's there. Uh, you just kind of got to know that it's there. Indeed. Oh. All right. Which of the following is an incorporated city? So for this, you might want to explain what the difference between incorporated and unincorporated is. Okay. Um, so, uh, in it, well, in Arizona, because other parts of the country used uh, terms like um, townships, villages. Um, in Arizona, we have towns and cities. Um, I think if you really want to get technical, um, they have a, uh, an actual population that goes with that. But we have towns or cities. Or else you're just a, a, a community um, designated place, which means like, for instance, the Santan Valley in between uh, North Florence or Florence and um, Queen Creek uh, actually has statistically, because they tried to become a city, uh, 55,000 people. But it's not a city. It's just a, a like a really, really large county island. Well, the same is said for uh Sun City, uh, Sun City West, and Sun Lakes. They're just huge clusters of, well, it, it's an age, you know, age-restricted communities, but uh, they really are adamant about, <laughs> about not uh, becoming part of any city because they want to pay, you know, less in taxes, where not only do they tie up the county's resources, but they're actually <laughs> technically, because they're uh, in in uh, some situations, technically, they're actually paying more in other things like higher insurance premiums because they're not part of a city. So they're they're trying to save money, but they they end up either paying more or paying just the same anyway. But but that's the thing is um, you're either in a town or a city or you're a county island, regardless of what's in your name. You know the 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 name is just merely interesting, like you know. And uh, and I know we didn't uh, cover this, but the same can be said for your your zip code, your zip code. Like, for instance, if your zip code says Scottsdale eight, five, two, five, four, that doesn't mean that you're in Scottsdale. That just means that your zip code goes to a, a, a post office station that is in that city. Uh, there's a there's a, a zip code up in northeast Phoenix slash Scottsdale. Uh, that says Scottsdale, I think it's 85254, 80% of that zip code is in Phoenix. 20% of that is in Scottsdale. Oh, that makes sense in terms of why I've seen places that I know are in Phoenix, but their address yes. puts them in Scottsdale. Yep, yep. just like I a school district does not that. necessarily, you know, uh, match city boundaries. It's, you know, um, so that's the, but, but there are people who honestly believe that it does, like real realtors try to sell you, hey, hey, you know, and this house is it is in Scottsdale because the zip code said no, well, no, but if you want to <laughs> believe that, yeah, right? And if the, you know, but, but I'm just saying, you know, uh, so that that's that's the thing, you know. So. Oh, I didn't realize that's how that happens. I just thought they, you know, sometimes being in New York, it's like there were neighborhoods that would be like, oh, we're part of the next neighborhood over because housing prices are higher there than they are in our neighborhood, so we're just gonna jump ship. So I assumed it was just, you know, we want to be in Scottsdale, so we're just going to make ourselves in Scottsdale, not that it had to do with the actual zip code they're in. Well, you know, and I could tell you, uh, here's, now here's a direct tie back to my family. So my great, great grandfather, um, you know, uh, uh, served on a lot of things. For instance, um, my great, great grandfather was an original city councilman. Um, he, he, he was uh, a deputy mayor during his time as an orig original city councilman in the 1880s. Uh, he was an original board member of the Phoenix Union High School District. So in doing that, when they were setting it up, um, they decided that they weren't going to follow um, or allow themselves to be controlled by city government. So that is why um, uh, you have uh, 
the uh, high school uh, district is separate from all the elementary schools, and both of them um, not only aren't conjoined like other school districts, but they also don't really fall uh, or follow geographic boundaries, and they kind of uh, overflow uh, off of um, uh, the city of Phoenix and kind of bleed into other cities because they didn't want a, a city government to be able to control them or their budget. And that was thought of as far back as the late 1800s. Wow. Yeah. All right. So which of the two communities are still owned entirely by a copper mining company? And is Baghdad and Marinci. So those are still company towns? Um, to, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Freeport wow. Grand owns most of the real estate. If there's anybody in the, in the chat or anything that can chime in on that, um, you know, I know that they have their big tower downtown and then they have a parent company. Um, you know, I didn't work in the, the mining industry. My, uh, my grandfather was a company mining doctor down in, in Gleason, which has been a ghost town forever. Um, uh, and, and all over Cochise County. But, uh, you know, to my knowledge, um, they own most of the real estate and they subsidize everything, you know, like, you know, they have uh, bashes, I think, in both communities and they wouldn't otherwise be down there except that, you know, uh, Freeport, you know, will make up for whatever shortfalls there are. So they have things down there that you wouldn't find in that small of a community because there's no money in it for them. But when you have a bankroll like their parent company has, they can right. kind of get anything that they want. Wow, that's fascinating. All right. So Rural Metro Corp. Fire Department began in present day Central Phoenix at 500 West Camelback Road. And that is true. Yeah, now um, uh, I, I worked in the fire service my, my whole career, um, and uh, I, I'm retired now or semi-retired, but uh, Rural Metro started after World War II, uh, Lou Wiseman. Um, most people think that Lou Wiseman started the company in Scottsdale. Scottsdale was uh, probably the first big city or larger community that he got a contract for, but he actually lived in the neighborhood of, uh, you know, present day fifth Avenue and Camelback road in Phoenix, because after world war two, that was two, two and a half miles out of the city limits. And the Phoenix fire department w wouldn't go up there. Um, so him and the neighbors got some surplus fire trucks and opened up, you know, he, he opened up a private business and started selling contracts and of course, over the decades, that company got bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually became, you know, uh, um, you know, sold public shares, went to other states. You know, uh, he sold the company and it got bought. You know, um, by the time I was in um, by the time I was in high school, Rural Metro probably had, I don't know, uh, 35, 40 fire stations um, in, you know, uh, Maricopa County. Um because most of the cities that we know today, they didn't have their own fire department. And in the state, they probably had 65 fire stations, 70. Uh, of course, they're, they're a lot smaller in Arizona today. But the parent company, you know, they own, you know, they, they have the world's largest ambulance company. And, and they own, you know, all kinds of different endeavors. But that all started with the fact that... Uh, somebody's house burned down in 1946 in that neighborhood. And uh, it was outside the city limits. Wow. And so nobody would come get it because it was outside of the city limits. Yeah. And that wasn't the first time something like that happened and involved, you know, uh, Lou Wiseman that, 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 that challenge, you know, it, that still kind of happens today where um, people, have a house in the county island and they have subscription fire service or they think that you know you know I, i'm gonna have this problem solved in minutes and it takes an hour 
only because, you know, uh, the street you decided to build on, um, you know, uh, again, politics. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but, but it's interesting. I mean, only because the, the, the company became so big and it all started again in, in Phoenix. Right. Yeah. All right. So the Hall of Fame, the Hall of Flame Firefighting Museum in Phoenix is the largest in the world fire museum. It, it is the largest. Uh, Mr. Getz, who came um, from Chicago or his family was based there. He had a lot of money. He uh, was kind of a fire buff. He uh, he basically moved the museum here i want to say about 50 years ago but it it progressively got bigger you know when i was a kid um it was one or two buildings and um you know it it literally i mean it the the campus over there um across the street from the zoo next to srp is is enormous i mean it, it acres it takes hours to go through and see everything um, mm -hmm. in fact, they have so much stuff in storage that it, it's, it, you know, with the space that they have, it's almost impossible to display everything that they have. Uh, they don't have enough space to show you everything that, that could be showed. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. And again, you know, from somebody who, who's, who's, uh, you know, been here a long time, uh, you know, a, a, a native, um, to, to talking to people who may, you know, just have recently arrived, that area of town used to have so much more. We used to have an amusement park um, behind the Hall of Flame by the zoo. M Mr. Maytag, uh, Maytag washers and dryers basically uh, uh, brought the zoo to us. Mr. Getz brought the fire museum to us, um, but we had a amusement park called Legend City, and then on the other side of that, we had a, a really fabulous wax museum. Uh, the wax museum in Legend City are gone now, mm -hmm. uh, sadly. But I grew up with those. And then uh, we had this uh, this trio, uh, Wallace and Ladmo and Pat McMahon, who had a show. And they used to perform all the time at at, uh, at uh, Legend City. So, you know, right. um, that, that whole area of town used to be a big entertainment venue. Indeed. All right. And so now we have our bonus questions. And so Mr. Galvin founded what company that became Arizona's largest private employer during the 80s? And that was Motorola. And then his wife was Virginia Piper of the Piper ah. Foundation. So that and so that's why the Piper Foundation gives away money. Um, and uh, it it's uh, it's interesting how big that they were, and now there's almost no evidence that they were even here. <laughs> you know, um, because uh, Motorola was enormous. Uh, when I was a kid, everybody knew somebody or somebody's mom or dad that worked at Motorola. Right. You know, Mo Motorola, Motorola, Motorola. And they made everything too, but not here. Uh, they only did semiconductors or government electronics here, but they made TVs, uh, two-way radios, pagers, cell phones. Uh, you know, I mean, they, it seemed like they made everything, you know? So... Indeed, and they stopped. And now it's interesting because they're now starting to up in North Phoenix. There is a group that's now building a semiconductor factory, um, trying to get back into that business, which is kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the uh, the very first building that he started with um, was a building that I, I want to say it's a charter school now at Fifty Sixth Street and Osborne. Um, that was the first one because there was seven, eight plants. Um, there was one way out by uh, 
Apache Wells on McKelps and 57th Street. Okay. Um, there, you know, there was the two big ones in town on McDowell, and then there was the one in Mesa on uh, on Broadway, you know, and then you had smaller ones. It, it, and then you had the one on Hayden and McDowell, um, you know, 52nd and McDowell. But, you know, um, they're all gone or they've been repurposed. But, but boy, you know, they employed, uh, you know, 60, 70, 80,000 people in the state. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was a lot of people. Indeed it was. All right. And so question 12 and our final question, the wholesome bakery was located near and it was Phoenix. So what, tell us about the wholesome bakery. Well, um, when my great, great grandparents came, came over on the boat, you know, all the way across the country on horseback in, uh, the late 1860s. And mind you, it was safe to do that. Then the Indian campaign, Indian wars, um, hadn't started yet. So I don't know. I, I've, I've told this story for, you know, a decade, decade and a half. I don't know <laughs> how they would have fared if they had tried this 10 years later. Uh, one of my, uh, great, great grandfather's brothers did a year, uh, with, uh, a year enlistment with the army and was, uh, with the fourth cavalry, uh, uh, you know, uh, out of, uh, camp Huachuca before it was Fort Huachuca and, you know, and, you know, they were pretty brutal and, you know, um, the, the people, you know, the, the indigenous population that didn't want to surrender or given, and I'm not taking sides cause, um, you know, that that whole thing, you know, for 150 or almost 150 years has been a, a black eye. I'm not you know, I'm not saying that that, that was a good thing. But uh, once that started, it was it was a, a horrible journey for people trying to cross the plains without some kind of a military escort. So I'm fortunate my family made it. But um, they came out here and uh, we you know, we started our bakery. And uh, uh, only after uh, my great great grandmother's sister married one of the Isleys, and they started in that building that you showed in the picture, uh, which was um, I want to say the address was 50 West Washington, and that's the actual building for for our viewing audience. Uh, Ed Isley uh, Jr. Um, graciously i i was told took some of the profits our our family ran uh or the family ran a wholesome from 1881 until 2008 and sold it out to flower foods and that building uh in the 70s was moved because of course you know operationally the 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 company got bigger and bigger buildings at different locations you know the the big one at i17 and uh lincoln and then one out in tolleson but that uh, basically got moved up to Pioneer Village and it sat for decades. And there was a, a big boondoggle about uh, what to do with that and, and, and then how Pioneer uh, uh, Village was, was run. And then it got trucked down to the zoo several years ago and he took uh, some of the money oh. that I guess he got in from the sale and he had that completely restored. So it's, it's in mint condition. It, it's code compliant. Um, there's all kinds of stuff inside and outside. So there's like a delivery vehicle in there. There's counters. There's some mannequins in authentic uniform. So you can kind of look at, you know, you can see what it kind of looked like. But you can also rent the venue if you're having like a wedding or a party, like right there in the foreground. You can see that's open. So you can okay. hire an event company to come in and put up canopies and then you can have the doors open. So it's a usable building, which which is code compliant. But also it's very historical because our, our family started with that building. And, and, and so I think it's fabulous because if you could have seen what it looked like after sitting on, a, on dollies for four and a half decades uh, up north, it, 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 it did not fare well. Um, sadly, though, um, since we're talking about wholesome, Flower Foods bought out all of the operations in 2008. And they just announced a couple months ago 
they're now ceasing all operations with Wholesome Bakery here in Arizona or in Phoenix. Now, there are other Wholesome Bakeries, but interestingly, in 2008, when we sold, they quit making Wholesome Bread at Wholesome Bakery. So from 2008 until now, they made all kinds of breads that Flower Foods makes, but they haven't, they haven't made Wholesome Bread here since 2008. So if I wanted to get it, I had to special order it on the internet because <laughs> 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 I can't get wholesome bread at the wholesome bakery. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's kind of sad. Indeed. Yeah. Well, I always love to wind up, ask people how they did. And people already have jumped in saying that they didn't get a lot right or they did, but you know, what I love to do is say, you know, it's not necessarily how many you got right or wrong, but look at the stories. So, Matt, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your family's history. Thank you. And so I really appreciate it. I know people have been chiming in going how much they love it as well. So thank you so much. Not a problem. And have a great rest of your night. You too. Ah, you know, thank you, Matt. That was really wonderful. So... Now, as we get ready for From the Vault, I do want to give a... Nope. No, no. I'm going the wrong way there. There we go. But yeah, so thank you so much for those stories. I do want to give a shout out to an earlier comment. Um, and so from, you know, we always try... I always try to include Indigenous history. We've had guests in the past... If you know of anybody who would be interested in coming on and sharing their stories, again, I always love to say the the guests kind of steer those stories and where they're coming from. So I love to have as many different communities and slices of Arizona history on talking about it. So our next segment is From the Vault. And so with From the Vault, it's something that you might drive by on a regular basis, but don't know what it is. And so we are going to talk a little bit about the Solari Bridge there at the waterfront in Scottsdale. So Paula Solari, who was an architect, he was the, his house is in Scottsdale and is called Cosanti. He also has a community that he built that's a sustainable community called Arcosante. If you haven't been, it's just up off the 17 and is well worth stopping. It's an amazing place. And so this bridge is situated due north and so that um, it actually creates a little bit of a shadow play at the equinox. So twice a year they do festivals out there um, as well as I know they're getting ready. They're really starting to push now Canal Convergence, which is coming up in November, which is a great, um, I think it's 20 plus artists from across the planet coming together and creating all these kind of engaging tech tech as well as fun and just engaging works of art and so in case you drive by now you know what those big silver cylinders are sticking up out of the waterfront so now you'll see why i always say you know if you're watching on facebook click on share because you know we have so much fun here with phoenix history and arizona history and there's still more more stories to share I'm, I'm working right now with somebody. We're going to start covering some artists from across the state, which is going to be really exciting as we start getting there as well. Um, next week, we have Ryan Reeves, and we're going to talk about some airport history, which I think was really fascinating. The more and more I kept hearing from Ryan, I was like, oh, my gosh, you really have to be a guest on Happy Hour. So that will be next Thursday at 7 o'clock. Same bat time, same bat channel. So now I always, if remember, if you have questions or suggestions, if you have ideas for folks who should be on. Now I know somebody threw another note out about somebody I should have on, someone who retired from something. I forget what it was. I'll go back through and find that. But again, that's where I get some of my best folks are just from people saying, hey, you know, you should have this person on. And then I cold called them and... <laughs> talk about that so i always love to give a shout out to cole and chris who did that great little video at the very beginning of the program as always pj my advisor 
so that way I know exactly what I'm going to be drinking that has a connection to what we're talking about and some Arizona history. And so in our outro, we are going to see a Dristan commercial from 1960. Because, you know, with this weather, I know with all this humidity, it's driving my sinuses nuts. I don't know about you, but we're going to hear from Dristan. When hay fever pollen invades your sinuses, brings runny nose, watery eyes, take Dristan. Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Yes, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. That is, Dristan helps you breathe free and easy, as if you were far away from pollen or allergy irritation. Yes, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Helps dry, runny nose, itchy, watery eyes. You see, Dristan tablets shrink swollen, congested nasal and sinus passages, which cause runny nose and watery eyes. So you breathe free and easy fast. So when pollen invades your sinuses, causing hay fever miseries, don't wish you could be in sunny, dry Arizona. Just remember, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Get Dristan decongestant tablets.